This is everyone who managed to pull through half a season with a 3.8 or higher next to their batting average since 1970. As you can see, the field is sparse, the graph resembling seeds blowing in the distance. That's because hitting 380 for an extended period of time is incredibly difficult. But for almost 80 years, baseball writers have waxed poetic of an even more improbable landmark that has lacked an occupant since before the events of Pearl Harbor, finishing a full season with a 400 batting average. You've already hit 400 through the first half of the season. That's kind of amazing in itself. Do you think you can do it in the second half? I'm not going to just come right out and say, yes, you know, it's going to happen. You know, but it's very likely it might happen if, if things go my way, the, the way they've been going, you know, the first half of the season. When Ted Williams finished his 1941 season with a 406 average, hitting 400 was considered a rarity. Since 1901, it had only been accomplished 13 times by nine men. Rare, sure, but not nearly considered impossible. Hell, by this time, a 50 homer season was more scarce, having only been accomplished eight times by four men. However, since then, that threshold has been crossed 39 times, while the vaunted 400 number has been gathering dust on the shelf with no captor in sight. Why though? What about hitting 400 is so impossible? I think we can learn a thing or two by looking at those who have come close but fell short of finishing the season with a 400 average, an achievement whose witnesses are becoming fewer and fewer, so that we can discover if the number is ever achievable in today's game, or if it's just a symbol of a bygone era. But before we start, I have to ask that you subscribe. And hey, comment below what video made you discover this channel. An adventure unlike anything on your planet. By the time Rod Carew suited up for the Twins on opening day 1977, he was already a Rookie of the Year recipient. 10 time All Star, and finished 5th, 9th, 7th, and 4th in MVP voting the four years prior. He could have retired and still been 4th in all time franchise F War, and 2nd if only counting players who actually stepped foot in Minnesota. He was a fan favorite there due to his wizardry with the bat. His career average was so high that he could have gone 0 for his next 500 and still have a respectable average to his name. Unfortunately, the same praise could not be given to his team. By 1977, baseball in Minnesota had hit a low point. They hadn't placed higher than third since getting swept out of the ALCS in 1970. Rod Carew was a part of that 1970 squad. However, despite starting the year on an absolute tear, an ill-fated double play attempt cost him the rest of the regular season, as he required surgery to repair a torn ligament in his right knee. Carew started his 1977 season with numbers eerily similar to those he posted in 1970, but instead of tearing his right knee, he decided to tear up the entire league. The hand. Here is the pitch to him. He swings and looks it out of the left field base. One run scores. White throw will not be in time. And just take a For roughly a calendar month, Carew had a 487 average, which would be the highest mark for anyone in the 70s far and away. Twins Faithful began to catch onto the hot streak, and suddenly Carew Watch dominated headlines across the Twin Cities, and not long after, the entire continental United States, as Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, Sports Magazine, Newsweek, and People Magazine ran features covering Carew's pursuit of 400, with his average topping out at 411 come July 1st. Then from there, a July slump. Except it wasn't really. Carew still posted an 895 OPS in July, still a higher OPS than what five-time All-Star and playoff hero Joe Carter was ever able to put up in a full calendar season. But 400 doesn't forgive the impersistent. It wasn't the fact that he was bad in July, it was that he was merely good, trading in some easy singles for more walks and power. Maybe the national attention diverted his focus away from his play. Maybe it was the fact that the summer heat bit him for a few weeks. But really, it was due to a 7 for 33 stretch he suffered from the start of 4th of July weekend to the 13th. You take this one stretch out, erase it from the records, and his average is sitting at 398 to end the season. From there, you can play 
pretty much any game you desire. Hey, what if he wasn't feeling well and couldn't play on September 2nd against the Yankees when he went over 4 against Cy Young contender Ron Guidry? What about May 22nd against the Angels? What about what August about 9th against the July 29th against the Angels? 9 of the only 20 games in which Rod Carew played all 9 innings without recording a hit were conducted by an opposing pitcher in the midst of a complete game. But that's the thing, 400 doesn't care about who you're facing. Hitting 400 requires an amount of mental and physical acuity that most human beings just don't possess. Even though Carew would finish the 1977 season 12 points shy of 400, as his team would finish 17 and a half games back of the Freddy Patek led Royals, hype around the Twins was reinstilled by the city of Minnesota, a hype that would persist decades after. For his efforts, Rod Carew would collect his lone MVP for the Twins that year. His number would be retired by them in July of 1987, as they would win their first World Series three and a half months later. Like Carew, George Brett had already established himself as one of the game's best by the time opening day 1980 rolled around. Unlike Carew, Brett only finished third in Rookie of the Year voting, but he had two top three MVP finishes before his 27th birthday. 1980 started innocently enough, with Brett amassing an 882 OPS through May 25th, which would be the highest of his career up to that point for the notoriously slow starter. Unfortunately for Brett, he thought he was going through a cold spell, as that MVP-worthy OPS translated into a career-worst 274 average. Nowadays, we would be encouraged to see that he was hitting the snot out of the ball while running into some Babbitt block, but back then, this was considered a troubling pattern for the four-time All-Star. Then, for almost a three-month span, Brett would ride one of the best stretches ever seen before, a stretch that put him in the company of someone who was in the middle of becoming the final man to hoist the flag of 400. As with Carew, the media came storming through the unassuming Midwestern city to capture every moment they could of someone who could potentially write his name into the illustrious catalog that they held to so dearly. While Carew wouldn't even sniff 400 after July 11th, Brett was carrying a 28-game hit streak responsible for a 394 average coming into August 17th. A fresh-faced kid straight out of college into the Royals' director of sales position recounts that home game against the Blue Jays and one of Brett's favorite clients of demolition, Jim Clancy. Brett came out of the game scorching, going 3-for-3 three three with an RBI double and a walk. In the bottom of the eighth, in a tight game and the bases loaded, Brett steps up to the plate. The young director of sales, who would eventually develop a friendship with Brett, describes the palpability of the at-bat. Baseball is a game that lets you soak moments in. Every pitch allows the viewer to take in the gravity of what's occurring, but even as a lifelong fan who's seen quite a few memorable moments at the stadium, the Royals' director of sales has never heard the crowd this raucous before. Brett laces a double to cash in on all three runs, all but securing the Royals' victory, and raising his average to 401 in the process while putting a crowd of 30,000 on their feet. Do you know what you mean to these people? He would tell Brett after the game. George took those words to heart somehow finding another step in launching his season into orbit during his next 14 games. And by the way, that young director of sales would grow up to become Rush Limbaugh. For Brett, those 14 games that gave him room to be a month away from clipping the fabled number was followed by 14 games that completely cratered those odds. Again, just like Carew, he wasn't bad, so much merely good. Like at the beginning of the season, he was still hitting the snot out of the ball while making contact at an inhuman rate, just running into some more nasty Babbitt look. But the lords of the game don't care about what's under the hood. They hide themselves in a round number made from a cold calculation that's most relevant when the game is stripped into its absolute simplest form. Not even a hot streak in the 11th hour that almost 
anyone watching him at the time could have predicted, was able to chuck his season beyond the 400 mark. And it's the rebirth of Slick. So check, check it out. Now you know we got a gang of cool jazz for your mind. It's a gang of cool jazz for your mind. From the planet's got a gang of cool jazz for your mind. If it kind of gets a gang of cool jazz for your mind. I'm cool like that. 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 I'm cool. Check it out. John Olerud was the least established out of the three we've talked about so far. But in 1993, he wasted no time shooting into the stratosphere, collecting 11 multi-hit games in April, four more than the amount of strikeouts he had that month. From there, he stabilized, keeping a steady hand that saw him sitting two months out while atop of 400, being the first person to use the number as his cushion through 100 games since, well... John Olerud wouldn't admit to being hyper-focused on this golden plateau, drawing more of his attention on his own team's accolades, often shuddering from any sort of comparison to Teddy Ballgame. Well, it's a, it's a great compliment to be compared to somebody like that. You know, I, I think that's, that's about uh, all you, you put into it, is that it's a great compliment. I've just been doing uh, this well so far for half of the season. This is my first real year that I've really uh, put everything together and I've been hitting the ball well. And so, uh, you know, it's nice to be compared to him, but uh, you know, you'd like to be compared to somebody like that uh, at the end of your career. Olerud understood the peaks and valleys of baseball, often chalking his own record-setting pace to a prolonged hot stretch that would eventually cool down. But nobody could have foreseen a cool down quite like Olerud's. He would spend a nearly 50-game stretch with cracks in his bat. And unlike Brett, the numbers under the hood weren't really giving much hope. Again, this isn't to say he was bad, but to be mortal for a long stretch means letting go of any hopes of hitting 400. Batting average is a constantly moving number, where no matter how hard you hit the ball, can only register a single hit or out per at bat. Unlike Carew and Brett, the eternally underappreciated Olerud wouldn't win the MVP that year, but his Blue Jays would win the World Series, an accomplishment he would trade the award in for 10 out of 10 times. Hitting for Nomar Garcia Parra was as instinctual to him as feeling unworthy is for you. The game of hitting was a ticking clock. It determined his every so action, from his laboriously consistent workout regimen to his chaotic yet routine shuffling of batting gloves after every pitch. A swing is not so much a decision as it is a natural reaction to a ball being thrown towards him, and contact is not so much an incidental result as it is an inevitability. This is what led him to collect the most hits for a rookie since Rod Crew's teammate, Tony Oliva, led the league in his 1964 season, as well as pick up his first batting title at the turn of the millennium as a 25-year-old. His approach was relatively unchanged year after year, if not reaching its epoch. His 2000 season started quietly enough by his lofty standards. An injury kept him out for a few weeks in May, but his Red Sox kept rolling, even winning five straight upon his absence. No more woke up on the morning of June 1st with a respectable slash line. Then, he'd go on to have one of the best Junes in Red Sox history. A dangerous spot here for Dan. And If you thought John Olerud's 11 multi-hit games and his superb April was great, Garcia Parra amounted a jaw-dropping 17 multi-hit games in June. If we're doing the math, well over half his games that month resulted in Garcia Parra picking up a pair or more hits. But something strange was happening. The Red Sox were starting to fade despite Nomar's Herculean feats, even falling to 7-10 and 10 in the aforementioned multi-hit games. Boston is a pressure cooker that just happens to have streets and buildings. Nomar was reminded every day about the legacy left by Ted Williams, whom he considered a friend by this point. 
but he was also reminded every day of the legacy left by legions of teams coming up short, going 82 years without a World Series trophy. Frustrations mounted, as just like with Olerud, Brett, and Carew, Garcia Parra came back to Earth for a very brief period of time. He started lashing out as a result of not only his own shortcomings, but for his teams, blasting Red Sox announcer Sean McDonough for commenting on the Red Sox poor offensive performance in August. Despite denial over the pressure resulting in a drop of performance, the results spoke for themselves, as not even a September hot streak could salvage 400. The Red Sox would fall two and a half games short of a playoff spot. Despite a 2001 loss to injury, Nomar continued his extraordinary play before the pressures of playing in Boston kept mounting and mounting. His frustrations became more of a distraction than a rallying call, and the Red Sox would deal him to the Cubs three months before winning their first World Series in 86 years. Throughout this video, I've been making subtle jabs at batting average as a whole. It's an antiquated method to evaluate a player's performance. It only gets its value when you gut the game to its bare minimum. It doesn't reward the litany of outcomes that are possible whenever a hitter steps up to the plate. So why do we care so much about hitting 400? One common thread we've seen throughout these stories is that people really care. But why? I don't know, they just do. It's baked into the mythology of the game. For this magic number that doesn't forgive, doesn't give extra credit where it's due, but there is so much out there that doesn't have any actual real-world impact that droves of people line up to see. Hell, over 18 million people tuned into the coronation of Prince Charles III, and that was just seeing some unemployed trust fund bloke getting his first job at the age of 73. It matters if enough people care about it, even if it doesn't matter why they care. It's a number that resonates deeply with old heads, and enough for the casual fan to want to tune in night after night. Sometimes that's all it takes for something to be considered special. But with the shifting of hitting philosophies, as well as the average Joe Schmo on the mound being able to throw 98 mile per hour gas, the quest for 400 has hit a lull. Maybe it was time to finally bury it where it belongs. Wait a minute. goes the 0 for 15 as well and now this one is hit pretty well to that right ear and cool before and he's going to be five for five Luis Arise is bringing the spirit of 400 back, and I'm here for it. Unlike those before him, we have a wealth of publicly available advanced analytics to dig deep under the hood of his historical pursuit. Naysayers will point to the fact that he's hitting too many singles, but the sheer volume of contact is what elevates his game into being elite. I know I said that batting average is largely irrelevant as an evaluation tool, but it's still a number that fuels a lot of what we do point out as being relevant. Let's put it like this. In the four seasons we went through, two resulted in very well-deserved MVP awards, another led the league in OPS+, and the latter finished top five in the league in F War. These are the types of seasons we remember, the ones we tell our kids about when we're passing the appreciation we have for the game down to them. So let's stop for a second, acknowledge that batting average is an imperfect lens to view the game through, while accepting the fact that Luis Arise's quest for 400 is something special and even if inflated by ancient ways of viewing the game, will be celebrated for years to come.